Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we have been reminded your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Come, Holy Spirit, and look for fertile soil in the hearts of those watching and listening, those that are gathered here under the watchful eye of your divine work, and work in them to accomplish the greatest joy that they will ever experience, transforming humanity until the day that we hear the words that we have been completely transformed into the likeness of your character. Now take this message and do what you intend for it, but may the glory always go only to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I know you have your Bibles. I want to have you turn to Matthew 13. That's where the message is going to be coming from. That's the foundation of the message. But I'm going to begin with the Scripture reading. You know, this is the time of year that I like to drive around farming communities. It's just beautiful. Have any of you noticed the green fields? Have you noticed that? The green fields, when you go down Highway 64 and you cut across to Highway 55, it looks like heaven just took out a, a can of green spray paint and just lavishly painted the fields. Flowers of varying kinds are just budding. They get so excited when God turns the sun on and warms up the earth. And when the rain comes, if you can envision, they open their, their, their botanical mouths and just drink in the refreshing dew that transfers them from a, just a small fledgling plant to a budding harvest. How beautiful it is. But I can't imagine, I cannot help but imagine that God is doing the same for us. The day is going to come when a command is going to be given. And then and only then would we be able to deeply appreciate that the Lord believed through the work of the indwelling Christ that one day we can all be like him. You find these words in Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to look together at verse 15. Then we're going to go over to Matthew to walk through this wonderful sermon together. Wonderful because of it coming from God's word. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. When Angie and I lived in Northern California, Angie worked in Napa Valley, and it was such a joy. We had a little travel trailer, about a 19-foot one. Sometimes we'd take it out on the weekends to the Napa Valley after church, we take our bicycles and our helmets, and we would just pedal through the vineyards and just stop along the way and look at those grapes, those tender grapes being nurtured in the vineyard, the automatic sprinkler systems, and how beautifully the rows were lined up. And when you look from the hillside, it just looked like such a work of art. And we think to ourselves, that although the farmers lined up the rows so symmetrically straight, their work would be in vain without the participation of God's handiwork. And I think today, as we look around the world, there are millions of Christians in the world today. And the greatest urgency is to recognize that there is a harvest coming. A day when the command is going to be given, thrust in your sickle and reap. And whatever we have become will be in that harvest. There are going to be two, those that are gathered into God's kingdom and those that are gathered 
and bound in bundles to be destroyed. As the Lord had put this message on my heart, I thought to myself, with the probationary time we all have, it just doesn't make sense to be in a bundle to be burned when we could be in the kingdom of God. It doesn't make sense to hold on to anything of this world that could rob us of the greatest joy and blessing that is now being prepared for those who trust God to get them ready for that grand harvest. I want to be a fat grape when Jesus comes, <laughs> just full of the presence of Almighty God. Jesus just brimming over because throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, somebody's going to get a taste that my life is the way it is because Jesus can finish what he started. Amen. The harvest is coming. I read a story about a man by the name of Howard Graham Buffett. He is the son of Warren Buffett, whose estimated worth is $112 billion. Just wrap your head around that on the weekend. Outside of his great wealth, that is, Warren Buffett and his son, one of his sons, Howard Graham Buffett, he grew up as a farmer in Takema, Nebraska. Now, you know Nebraska is farmland. Amen. Nebraska, far and wide, you could see cows and fields. But today, Howard Graham lives in Decatur, Illinois, on his 1,500-acre land, and he says he takes pleasure in looking out, especially during the time when the fields are getting ready for harvest. He talks about how sometimes de debilitating and depressing the winter is because the fields are barren and dry and there's nothing delightful to look at but how he loves to see the field being ripened for the harvest. And he said something that I thought would be useful for the message today. It actually reveals the mercy and the patience of God. He said this, each of us, and he talked about the cycle of farming, and Jeff Dorr probably knows this better than any of us. He says each of us has about 40 chances to accomplish our goals in life. I learned this first through agriculture because all farmers can expect to have about 40 growing seasons, giving them just 40 chances to improve on every harvest. Think about that. Am I right, Jeff? If you live 40 years and have 40 crops and they're good, you say, we've had a really good life. And you look at the seasons, you look at the rains, you become almost, as it were, a specialist in understanding the times of the year and what that weather pattern means. You understand the window, when to plant and when it's too late to plant. And when you have missed the window, you understand it's just not going to be that great of a harvest. You become a scientist almost in the art of agriculture. And when he said that, that we each have about 40 chances to improve on every harvest, I cannot help but to think that God has given me more than 40 chances to improve so that when the harvest comes, I will have no excuse. I cannot say that there was a season that I just didn't have enough time to nurture what God has planted in my life, to water it, to pull out the weeds that may try to choke its maturity. And every day that you breathe, every opportunity you get to wake up in the morning is another chance to improve on the coming harvest. For the fact of the matter is we can tell by global signs that the return of Jesus is not far distant. Matter of fact, his disciples asked in Matthew 24, verse 3, these words. They said, tell us when shall these things be? And not only the end of the world, but the harvest. He says, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? The Apostle Paul reminds us, as followers of Christ, there is no need to ask for information. We've got all the information we need in God's Word. If anybody needs to be well informed, it is those of us claiming to be followers of Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 and 2, he says, 
But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, remember, don't ignore the alert that the signs of the seasons bring to us. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need, he said, that I should write to you. For you yourselves know what is the next word. Perfectly. You've got the information. You know that the day of the Lord will so come as a thief in the night. It's going to come as a thief in the night on those in the world. It is not going to come as a thief in the night on those of us that are in the Lord. Because he continues by saying, we are not children of the night but of the day. We don't walk in darkness, we walk in light. And there is no reason, I say this again, you'll hear that word a number of times, there is no reason why the people of God should miss out on the grandest gathering event of the ages, the reaping, the gathering into the kingdom of God. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be. But for those that miss it, it's going to be a debilitating reality. It is at that moment that they're going to realize that they've given up everything for nothing because there'll be nothing left. The, the earth and all of its works will be nothing but ashes under the soles of our feet. There'll be no mansions, no clubs, no partying, no rising and falling stark market. There'll be no yachts still casting out to sea. There'll be no lavish lifestyles. The rich and famous will be ashes. Anyone who does not prepare for the coming of the Lord will have a harvest of regret. And when we look at the world today, the times and seasons are so obvious to us that there's a danger that we can take the signs for granted. So let me briefly remind you this morning of what you might know that is happening in the news. We can get excited about a stable stock market, but make no mistake about it, we live in an unstable world. When the disciples asked Jesus, he said these words to them in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 7. Look at it with me. Let's remind ourselves. The first thing he said was, take heed that no man does what? Deceives you. We are living in an age of deception. Deception of every kind. Religious deception. Moral deception. Political deception. No need for an amen there. Deception of every varying degree. Take heed that no one deceives you. And then he talks about spirit, spiritual deception. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do we hear of wars and rumors of wars? Yes. But he says, when you hear about it, see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Is it happening today? And there will be famines, pestilences. That's what COVID is. And earthquakes in various places showing up in places that are not known for earthquakes. My brothers and sisters, those of you watching and listening, we are living in what I call God's probationary time. The probationary time that God has granted to us is the time between the planting and the harvesting, the planting of the seeds and the harvesting of the crops. It is also a time allotted by God so that we can grow. What word did I just say? Pay attention. Grow into the fullness of Christ. Because when the harvest comes, it is the intention of Christ that we shall be like him. We will see him as he is, for we shall be like him. I am looking forward to the day when I can fully be like Jesus. When his character has been fully reproduced in my life, there's no need to be discouraged. The greatest harvest to ever be accomplished is just before us and make no mistake about it what we will be we are now becoming say that with me what we will be we are what now becoming as is the case Jeff knows this well and Jeff excuse me for referring to you again but I know you're a farmer Jeff knows that if he plants broccoli that while the broccoli is growing 
it's not going to say, I want to be an orange instead. It's impossible. It is going to be what that seed has ordained and predetermined it to be. We cannot, along the way, live a life for the world and at the crisis moment say, but I want to be a Christian. If we wait to the last moments of the time of preparation, we will be caught in a moment where we are unprepared and the opportunity for development of Christian character will have passed us by. So now let's take an excursion together in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. One of the most revealing lessons of the harvest Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 13. Let's look at it together. Matthew 13, beginning with verse 24 to verse 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed what kind of seed? Good seed in his field. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed what? Tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tears also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tears? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tears, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tears and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. What a parable. There are seven components in this parable. We will walk through them together. The first thing we find in this parable is, let's say it together, the sower. We're going to get the definition of that in a moment. Those of you that are experienced, you know exactly what that means. Secondly, we have the image of the what kind of seed? The good seed. That's what the parable says. Thirdly, we have what? The field of operation, what does it call? The field. The farmer calls it the field. Those who plant the seed, they don't plant it on the sidewalk or in the backyard unless the backyard is a field. Then we have the fourth thing. What do we have? The enemy, the nemesis. The nemesis, he's also there doing his work while the good seed are planted. Then we have the next thing. What is it, friends? The tears. And then we have the event we're all looking for, which is what? the harvest. And finally, we have in the picture, what is it? Together, say it. The reapers. These seven components are so significant in the developing of the harvest. You see, what the Lord intends is not what the enemy intends. What the enemy intends is not what the Lord intends. So now let's go ahead and break down the meaning of this parable. If you want to follow in your Bibles, Let's begin in verses 37 to verses 43 in Matthew chapter 13. This is going to be profound today. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is, together, the Son of Man. The field is uh, the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tears are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is what? The end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend 
and those who practice lawlessness. Why? Because they won't be in the kingdom. And will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And this is a power, this is a, this is a, are you listening statement. He who has ears to hear, say it with me, let him hear. Let's, let's lock in on this. Let's all pay attention. Let's look at this together. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That statement really was driven home to me. I've got ears to hear, but I need spiritual ears to hear. Amen. Let's now break down the definition. Let's look at that. The definition of the sower, say it together, who is the sower? Son of man. There's a reason for this reiteration. Secondly, the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. Thirdly, the field is the world. Fourthly, the enemy is the devil, the nemesis. Number five, the tears are the sons of the wicked one. And I want you to notice before we go any further, they're both in the same field. Number six, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. I want to make a profound statement that will get Jesus off the hook right away. Because if you read this parable, I'm going to give you some insights to this. It appears as though, from all extent and perp from all evidences that the person seeing the farmer out there throwing his seed, he doesn't see the enemy working. He just sees the farmer. He just sees the farmer because the enemy does his work at night. He doesn't do it by the side of the farmer sowing good seed. He waits till the farmer is not active and he comes and he does his work by night. But Jesus does not sow bad seed. Luke tells us in Luke 8, verse 11, the seed is the what? The Word of God. So the seed that produces the seeds of the children of the kingdom, God's Word is the food that when we ingest, Paul says in the book of Ephesians, it effectively works in those who believe it. What am I saying? We cannot grow as Christians getting ready for the harvest if we are not eating and digesting and imbibing and studying God's Word. It is impossible. God's Word is not a book just intended to intellectually stimulate us and give us information about the accuracy of Bible prophecy and all the forebodings of the end of the world, but it is, its greatest intent is as was the case in the wilderness journey, the Lord fed the children of Israel with manna every day. But as was the case then, so is the case today. They didn't want the manna. They wanted a diet that pleased their appetite. And sadly enough today, while the Word of God is easy to access, you can find the Bible in any store, practically. You can get old Bibles, new Bibles. You can find them at yard sales, garage sales. You can get them at Walmart for less than a dollar. You can get them in any translation, any size. You can get a digital hard copy, soft copy. You can get a leather-bound version, a wood-bound version, a cardboard-bound version. You can get a softback version. You can have a digital version. You can have it in Braille, or you can have it made so that people with eyes can see it. There is no scarcity of the Word of God. Can the church say amen? amen. So what's the issue? Today... I'm laying some foundation, some foundation very methodically because there are some quotations today, and I must apologize ahead of time. I don't usually do this, but as I was studying for this sermon, the Lord has revealed to me such depth of the resources in the inspired writings of God's messenger, Ellen White. And I'm going to share many of them with you today. Because I said to my wife as I was putting the sermon together, I said, honey, I have a problem. My problem is what do I include and what do I leave out? Matter of fact, there's so much material just about the topic of the harvest that I could do an entire six-part series on just the harvest and still not exhaust it. So I've taken the time to 
be as methodical, and I'm going to leave out all the anecdotal stories so I can get to the meat of the message. I've taken the time so that we can know that what the Lord intends, his dream for his children, he has provided everything we need so that one day, as corrupt as we are, we can be incorruptible and immortal throughout eternity. He believes by the work he has accomplished that one day the angels will see us coming in heaven and say, now I know Bob is safe because you finished the work you started. We are not going to enter the kingdom and be a risk in eternity. We are going to enter the kingdom fully clothed in the completed righteousness of Jesus. There will by no means, Revelation 22, there will by no means enter into it anything that defileth. But what is the time of probation all about? This is the time to weed out of our lives anything that may hinder our spiritual growth in preparation for the harvest. So when we come to the Lord, Bible study is what I call the, the simplest regiment but the most profound regiment in getting us ready for the coming of the Lord. And when you study the Bible, you know one day we're going to be incorruptible, but you can't be incorru incorruptible if you put corruptible things where the incorruptible should be. The incorruptible Word of God is a part of the preparation for those of us who will be incorruptible. Look at how Peter says it. What is the Word of God referred to as by the Apostle Peter? He says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, Having been born, how? Again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So when God's Word is sown in our lives, it will affect in us a righteousness of character that we do not naturally possess. Can I ask you a question? Do you sense your life changing? Now, I pray that it's changing for the better. Your life will not change for the worse if what you're putting in it on a constant, continuous basis is the Word of God. Your life will never be worse in studying God's Word. One of the reasons why the enemy does all he can to prevent us from digesting God's Word is he knows that you cannot be corruptible if you're feeding on that which does not corrupt. Did you get that? So he gives us a corrupt menu to harmonize with our corrupt nature to keep us from being incorruptible. So you see, let me, let me go ahead and dispel a, a, a theory here. We believe that we will put on incorruption, and will we? But the Lord is not saying to us, you have to wait till then to be incorruptible. He is saying by imbibing my word today, which is incorruptible, you can live a life now where sin has no impact on you at all. Amen. Don't have to wait till that day. That's why it's sometimes depressing when people say to me, you know, we're going to always sin until Jesus comes. What about the power of what about deliverance from the power of sin? Deliverance from the penalty is justification. Sanctification is the deliverance from the power of sin. That's a day by day. One day we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin. But we don't have to, we don't have to believe that because sin is present that we've got to imbibe in it. That's what the power of sanctification is all about. And you cannot be sanctified without the Word of God. Sanctify them by my truth. Thy Word is truth. And when you read God's Word, please don't miss the capabilities that are stored in God's Word. This book is more powerful than a nuclear plant. Because a nuclear plant cannot produce a righteous person. It could incinerate you, but it cannot produce a righteous life. Look what the Bible says about the capability of God's Word. Matthew 13, 33. Matthew 13, 23. Thank you. But he who receives 
He who received, he who did what? Received seed. You can't just read it. You got to receive it. He who received seed on what kind of ground? The good ground. That means a heart that's softened to let the Lord have his way. Is he who hears the word and what else? Understands it. And what else? Who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Now, why would the devil stand idly by and let you become like Jesus? He's got imps that work for him. They don't take vacations. Does anybody know that for a fact? They know your address. They got your cell number. They know your internet address. They know what you like and what you don't like. They understand your appetite. They know exactly what thrills your fancy. They have an agenda for you waiting after the Sabbath. There's some demons outside standing by your car, Ramona. Can't wait till she leaves church. I don't want to go in there because I don't want to hear the Bible. Have you experienced that battle? Have you felt the ire of the anger of the enemy? Sometimes it happens in your family. Sometimes it happens at your job. Sometimes even a pastor might lose his mind every now and then, like I did not too long ago. Servant of the Lord must not quarrel. I found myself in a quarrel. Shame on me. But thank God he forgave me, and so did the person I quarreled with. You see, you've got to understand, we've got to be awake. Because the enemy is not going to stand idly by. The devil knows and he understands that if he allows God's word to be sown in us, we will produce harvests or produce fruit that might look like Jesus. And I cannot have people in the world letting other folk in the world know that Jesus is real. Jesus does not reveal himself to us. He reveals himself through us. Amen. He will not reveal himself through us if we don't have the fruit that re resemble him. And what are those fruit? Here they are, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. Can we read that together? But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. What else? Kindness. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and I love the way it ends, against such there is what? No law. Excuse me for being repetitious. You will never go to jail and serve a life sentence for being too peaceful. Amen. And what are you accusing Robbie D of? She is just too loving. We got to lock her up. I don't like those Adventists. They're just too kind. Somebody ought to get rid of them. And you might think that's cynical, but that's what the devil is saying. That's what he's saying. I cannot have that church filled with loving, kind, gentle, patient folk. They might believe that Jesus is real. So I got to have them argue with each other, fight with each other, talk about each other, backbite each other, gossip about each other, amplify the other person's sin. <sighs> that's the plan. Let them go to church. We need them in the church because we need them to tear each other down in that church so nobody wants to go to that church. Yeah, that's what we... Let them go to the church. Return their tithe, sing songs, but we know who they really are. So to prevent the fruits of righteousness, Satan does some sowing of his own. And I want you to understand... I'm going to read a passage, what he's doing, and when he's doing it. Look at Matthew 13, verse 25. But while men, say it with me, slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. Can the enemy sow seeds while you are awake? No, you got to be spiritually asleep. What does spiritually asleep really translate into? I don't even have a 
an appetite for spiritual things. Church, I go on my own schedule. I don't really have to study my Sabbath school lesson. That's optional. Why do I have to witness? Let, let Don and Janelle do that. Evangelism, that's the pastor's job. It's not mine. You know, he's going to get excited about prayer meeting and tell us about that on Sabbath, but that's just him. The enemy said, let him blow off steam. You continue with what you're doing. He's just tripping, sleeping. You think that God calls pastors? We are not perfect. We are still growing just like you. But I got I to gotta say to you as fellow laborers, if you think that salvation is something that the enemy enjoys, you are sleeping. If you think that we could live the way we live on a crooked river and just get ready for the coming of the Lord when the world starts falling apart, it's the greatest lie the enemy would ever tell you. If we are not day by day preparing our lives for the coming of the Lord, we are sleeping. And the enemy is saying, I love this. Let's go to that house. They all sleep. They don't think that you should go to church more than one day of the week. After all, I mean, they've been doing that for 35, 40 years. Why, why, why switch? Why change my habits now? That's why I like Oswald Chambers. He says, Christians should have a habit of having no habits. Christians should not even have habits. We sometimes worship our habits. Don't call me at 3 o'clock. That's when I study my Bible. So somebody's in crisis at 3 o'clock, but they can't rely on you because you have a habit of studying your Bible at 3. How dare you interrupt me with your need while I'm studying my Bible? This is my habit. Don't get into the danger of worshiping your habits, even if they're religious. Because the Lord comes at an hour that you do not think and say, I need you now. Put your Bible down. There's a neighbor that has a need. When the Apostle Paul grew out of his life of rebellion, he understood what it meant to be asleep. Very educated, Pharisee of Pharisees, Jew of the Jews, Roman of the Romans. He had it all. And he had to be awakened by God. That's why he says to us today in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us, what are the two things, my brothers, my sisters? Watch and be what? Sober. Look at this. Watch and be sober. Here's how you do it. This is the spiritual, this is the spiritual posture. I'm sleeping with my right eye. I'm awake with my left. That's not what he means. He means you have on the whole armor of God. You have on the breastplate of righteousness. You got the shield of faith. You have the helmet of salvation. You have so worked with the sword of the Spirit that you can cut error on its way to you. And after all that, you know you still have to stand and you better pray without ceasing. He doesn't like soldiers of the cross. He likes church members. Because you are a member. You know, you're a member. You're not a disciple yet. You're a member. You hang out here. He's afraid of soldiers. Those that know we're in a battle. He likes members. Because they, they set their own conditions. But disciples deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus. Soldiers are in the watchtower looking for the enemy, blowing the trumpet when they see him coming. My brethren, don't, be, don't settle for membership. Go to fellowship and discipleship and become a soldier of the cross. This quotation in Christ Object Lessons is a chilling one, but it brings into sharp focus what happens, why the harvest is so significant. It takes us down a historical road. Listen to this. Christ Object Lesson, page 71, paragraph 1. In the East, men sometimes took revenge upon an enemy by strewing his newly sown field with the seeds of some noxious weed that while growing 
closely resembling wheat springing up with the wheat injured the crop and brought trouble and loss to the owner of the field. They're growing together. They look like wheat, but they're so close to them. They're growing with them. So it is from enmity to, enmity to Christ that Satan scatters his evil seed among the good grain of the kingdom. The fruit of his sowing he attributes to the Son of God. He said, they're in your church. I don't have anything to do with that. By bringing into the church those who bear Christ's name while they deny his character. The wicked one causes that God shall be dishonored. The work of salvation misrepresented and souls imperiled. Tears closely resemble wheat, but their purposes are opposite. They are not there to help you grow. They are there to prevent you from growing. Some very significant observations. What does this all mean? The germination of the seed represents the beginning of your Christian journey, your Christian life. It's when the Lord brings you out, you're born again, you're new, you're reading the Word of God, the seed is being planted. That's the beginning of the spiritual life. But the development of the seed represents the development of the Christian character. You see, either a plant is growing or it's what? Dying. It doesn't get to a certain place and stay there. If it gets to a certain place and stay there, it's dead. Somebody once talked about the vicious nature of why, and this is sad, I mean, I love roses, but somebody once said, it's such a terrible thing, we cut these roses and we give them some, to somebody, and they're beautiful for a few days because we have severed them from their life source, and they can't maintain that beauty for long. The devil wants to sever us from our life source so that we will look beautiful for a certain period of time, but disconnected from our life source, we will wither and die. Growth is silent, imperceptible, and constant. Christian growth is not coincidental, it is intentional. We've got to be disciplined so that we can know that we are getting ready for the coming of Jesus. What are your plans for spiritual growth? Do you plan your spiritual growth like you plan your vacation? Or you plan the clothes you wear? Or you plan the store you go to? Do you plan your spiritual growth like anything else in your life that has to be structured? Or is it something that happens coincidentally? We cannot grow without the study of God's Word. That's why He gave it to us. Notice, the Apostle Peter knew it. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, he says, As newborn babes desire the what kind of milk? Pure milk of the Word that you may do what? Grow thereby. So can God's Word cause us to grow spiritually? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you got to study it. I told you about my wife and I. We're going through our Bible together. And there are some days, to be very candid with you, there are some days that the world is so in our face that we miss our Bible study for two or three days. And believe me, we feel it. We get irritable. She tells me off, I tell her off. You irritate me. Well, you irritate me too. You know what we do? We know that's the absence of God's Word. When you are not feeding yourself, you become an irritant to yourself. And the enemy says, I like that version of Pastor Loma King when he tells his wife off. When they get on each other's nerves. I'm being real to you. We are not, no, we're not some finalized process. We're in the process. But then we quiet down for a while and then we start talking until we get nice to each other again. And then we say, let's read our Bible. <laughs> it happened yesterday. <laughs> I know what I'm, I'm not preaching theory. I'm, I'm preaching what I know. This, this is real life. Got skin on. We got skin. 40 years. You think you've been nice to each other for 40 years? Nah, brother. The old people ought to say amen. amen. Watch out, Jeff. You don't say it too loud. 
It's a process, but you got to be intentional. You cannot exclude God's Word. And even when you mess up, even when you mess up, what I love about God is He knows that we are not there yet. Does He know it? He knows that we are not there yet. Some of us are farther from the finish line than we ought to be because we keep getting off the track. But for those of us that are struggling in the journey, God said, I got provision for that. Here it is. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. This is why we do this. But grow in the grace. And what else? Knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. We need grace to grow. I know I need it. We need grace. Because sometimes we are reminded that some of us is still, some of me is still left in me. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So when you, when you, what I'm talking about today is when you don't, when you don't get real, don't think that the devil ain't going to get real. He's go, he going to stay real all the time. He is real all the time. He's real about our destruction. So we've got to get real about our salvation. You want to hear purposeful growth? The Apostle Paul talked about pur purposeful growth. You know, when he came to the end of his life, he says, I have finished my course. He said, what? I finished my course. I kept the faith. I fought a good fight. He did all that. He knew that it's a fight on a day-by-day -day basis. But look at what he said about his continuous, his purposeful growth. He said this in Philippians 3 and verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I do what? Press Are you pressing? If you're not pressing on, you're pressing off. Press on. Don't press off. What is he pressing? Look at the next verse, verse 14. I press toward the what? Go for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You've got to know that God has a goal for every one of us. He has a goal for every one of us. He has a goal for every one of us. Isn't that nice? He's got a goal for every one of us. I want to call names because we're all in God's goal. He wants us. The devil doesn't like us. Don't fool yourself into thinking that by ignoring Jesus, there's some kind of better option in the second garage. No. There is life and there is death. There is eternity gained, eternity lost. There is the joy of heaven, the agony of hell. There is life everlasting and agony that will one day just fade away and take you with it. But before we came to Jesus, he set some goals for us, and the devil doesn't like it. He set goals for us. He accepted us as we are, and he set goals for us that if we follow the Lord's goals, we will be what he intended those goals to produce. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians 4, verse 13 and 14. He's got goals for us. Till, what's the word till mean? Until you get there, here's my plan. Till we all come to the, say it together, unity of the faith, and what else? Knowledge. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a what kind of man? Perfect man. Mm -hmm. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be what? Children. What kind of children? tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Let me make a statement right here that fits in here. One of the reasons why even Seventh-day Adventist Christians are facing doctrinal controversies and ch being challenged in their theology, which is scriptural, is because they don't have a clear understanding of it themselves. Some people rely on somebody else to tell them what they believe. So when somebody starts questioning the divinity of Jesus and the validity of the third person of the Godhead, and then at the same time claim to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you have not been drinking God's Word. You can't study God's Word and deny or even question the divinity of Jesus. We know that the, the, the questioning of the sanctuary has been a controversy for decades. And some people still don't understand what that means because you're not studying. 
You cannot be a spiritual illiterate and expect to not be a target of the enemy. So when I hear people and pastors and people that I thought had some solid theological foundation, when I hear them walking away from the truth, I said, you know what? There was something about them, and I'm not saying that I saw it, but I said there was something about them that they have been hiding, and the Lord allowed controversy to come to them to reveal their true nature. Amen. You cannot be studying God's Word. You cannot have your Word, your life anchored in God's Word, and the devil comes up and root that anchor out. No, the Bible says when your house is built on the rock, the winds and the waves are going to come. They're going to beat vehemently on that house, but because you are built on the rock, it will stand. Amen, somebody. But so many of us don't pay attention to the necessities. We cannot come to unity. So why does Satan sow tears? To prevent the unity of the faith. Why does he sow tears? To prevent us from gaining a knowledge of the Son of God. That's why we begin to question who the Son of God is. So some person apostatizes and writes a book, we read it and believe their junk over God's Word. That's the evidence. If you see that in your life and you're being shaken, people post on YouTube, I'm no longer a Seventh-day Adventist. I ain't going to celebrate that. You left because you didn't have a foundation. That's not saying the Seventh-day Adventist church is wrong and it's doctrinal. That means you got shaken out. And that's another evidence that we're living in the time of the end. The shaking will happen. Anything that can be shaken shall be shaken. That's why Ellen White says in Great Controversy and also the book Doctrines Before Dawn, only those, who are only those that have fortified their minds with the word of truth will stand through the last great conflict. Amen. What's going on in your mind? How much space do you have for God? Satan sows seeds so that we knew, would not pursue the perfection of life in Christ. He sows a seed to stop us from attaining a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He sows seed to keep us as children. No spiritual growth, no spiritual maturity, no spiritual progress. Because, by the way, I live my walk with Christ on my own terms. That's why Jesus said, if anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself. He sows seeds so that when these doctrinal controversies arise, that we will be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. I had somebody challenge me at a constituency meeting. An elder of a church, what's your belief about the divinity of Christ? I said, excuse me, he's Jesus, the self-existent one. You have a problem with that? How can you prove that? He's the Alpha and the Omega. You have a problem with that? He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. What's your position? And the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life came out of that man's mouth. Well, I believe that Jesus was created way back, way back, way back, way back, way back where? Eons and eons. And I said, you sound like an evolutionist. If he's not the creator, he's the created. And the created cannot be the redeemer. You don't create, you can't redeem something that you have, bit, that you are a part of. That's why you're to come to camp meeting. The Lord has given me a sermon called Affliction Will Not Rise Up a Second Time. I'm a sledgehammer that topic. Because there are some people now that think that sin will rise up in heaven. God have mercy. Oh, yeah, we got pastors that teach that. That said, there's a possibility because we have freedom of choice. And the Bible says nothing will enter heaven that defiles. Do they not realize that they're bordering on the fact that they're believing that Jesus' righteousness is not efficacious, that the blood of the Lamb cannot really take away sin? So there's a chance of a second great controversy? You mean to tell me this is what happens when you're not studying? Some intellectual whose mind, has been, whose mind has been molded to believe what is not supported by Scripture comes along with some thesis that sounds plausible, and we say, that sounds about right. And we haven't consulted God's Word. 
If the Bible says affliction will not rise up a second time, I'm dumb enough to believe that. No. I'm spiritual enough to believe that God says what he means. Satan sows seeds that when men want to trick us and deceive us and are crafty to twist us, it'll happen. Look at what Ellen White says in the Great Controversy, 1888 edition, page 519. Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents <laughs> every possible device to engross the mind. This generation has a disease that our generation didn't have. Ron's generation didn't have it. Bob's generation. If I pull you onto the old category with me, just bear with me. This generation has a disease that we didn't have to deal with. We actually went outside. We actually went outside, rode our bikes, played ball in the park, kicked balls, hopscotch, double dutch. Now, I didn't jump double dutch, but we actually knew who lived next door to us. This generation, they don't know who lives in, because they're all prisoners of some digital device. Fat kids. Look at the pictures. Look at the pictures. There's a generation that people actually were in shape, not this generation. I was reading an article in familyaddictionspecialist.com. It'll blow your mind. They talk about digital addiction. Listen to what they said. I just summarized it. It's a seven-page article. It will blow you away. They first point out the, digi they, they, they first point out the digital dangers. Texting while driving. This is a generation of increased road fatalities taking pictures on the edge of cliffs, hanging over bridges, climbing life-threatening structures just for a picture. That's the dangers. Look at the health impact that this generation has to deal with that we didn't have to deal with. Skipping eating, drinking, sleeping because they don't sleep because the device use is of higher priority. They deal with depression, anxiety, attention, deficit disorder, ADHD as well as an increased suicidal rate among teenagers because they cannot measure up to the images and stereotypes on digital media. Restlessness, irritability, agitation and anger, overstimulation of the brain, they call it dopamine flooding, the pursuit of the feel-good chemical, increase in headaches, back aches, carpal tunnel syndrome, insomnia, increased stress. I'm just getting started lack of exercise, inadequate self-care, and poor hygiene. They say that in some countries, in Japan, for example, young men, teenagers, early 20s, wear diapers so they don't have to get up from their games. They found a young man dead, had been dead a day. He sat at his digital PlayStation and died in diapers. Poor hygiene. Look at the social impact. Lying to hide their devices from family, friends, and spouses. Children suffer from lack of touch from parents because the parents are on their devices. Estrangement from children, spouses, or people in your home. You don't even know who's in your house. Little, little to no communication while eating out with others. I've seen people at a restaurant, they look at their devices, they don't even see who's across the table. Increased guilt and shame from immoral digital viewing on the internet. Decreased attention span in school due to sleeping with their devices. Lower grades increase in school dropout rates. Look at the spiritual impact. The average youth spends two and a half hours daily on social media and uses about eight apps. The average Christian does not even spend half that time to read the Bible and pray. Bible reading has become obligatory rather than reading to gain a knowledge of who God is. And I just scratched the surface. You may not have heard about this man, but what he said is profound. You can look up who he is. I'll just tell you what he said. Smith Wigglesworth, what a name. He said, the reason the world is not seeing Jesus is that Christian people are not filled with Jesus. They are satisfied with attending meetings weekly, 
reading the Bible occasionally, and praying sometimes. It is an awful thing for me to see people who profess to be Christians lifeless, powerless, and in a place where their lives are so parallel to unbelievers' lives that it is difficult to tell which place they are in, whether in the flesh or in the spirit. Ask people like Simon Sinek, who's a very well sought after public speaker. He talks about the addiction among young people. And I wish it were just young folk, but some old folk are just as digitally addicted as young people. The reason why it's becoming so easy for Christians to be mean, offensive, unloving, unforgiving, unholy, without natural affection, prideful, lacking tenderheartedness towards one another, is that's what they see on social media. Folk cussing each other out. Irreverent, unholy, unashamed about it. I had to write a family member just the other day. I said, that's not who you are. That's not how your name needs to be remembered on the internet. They tried to make an excuse. I said, no, you are worth more than that. And they wrote back, thank you for thinking about me. Love you, love you. You see, child guidance takes it a step farther. Page 162, paragraph two. The formation of character is the work of a lifetime, and it is for eternity. If all could realize this, if they would awake to the thought that we are individually deciding our destiny for eternal life or eternal ruin, what a change would take place. How differently would this probationary time be occupied? And what different characters would fill our world? Amen. Peter the Apostle knows what it's like to be a victim of Satan. After his conversion, he warns us today, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Let's keep going. Maranatha, page 95, paragraph 3. Satan is now more earnestly engaged, this is an amazing statement, in playing the game of life for souls than at any previous time. And unless we are constantly on our guard, he will establish in our hearts pride, love of self, love of the world, and many other evil traits. He will also use every possible device to unsettle our faith in God and in the truths of his word. And we think that we can do this, but reap that. Paul clarifies that. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. Which begs the question, what are we sowing? What are we sowing in the 168 hours of the week? Some people say, Pastor John, you preach too long. Well, I don't see you any other time but just this. Because I can't buy you a prayer meeting seat. We have to make our prayer meeting room smaller just to feel like it's filling up. Because we are so ready for the coming of the Lord that we just don't have time to sow anything more than an hour a week. Vespers don't see you there. Bible study don't see you there. And we're getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Well, I like the way that Alan White put it. Look at this in Adventist Home, page 68, page 16, paragraph 2. She says, if you have become estranged and have failed to be Bible Christians, I love this, this is straight up, be converted for the character you bear in probationary time will be the character you will have at the coming of Christ. Make no mistake about it. If you would be a saint in heaven, you must be a saint on the earth. Stop telling folk off. Stop talking about people. Stop backbiting people. Stop destroying people's character. 
Stop examining other people's sin and examine your own. The traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death or by the resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. And she ends by saying, Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done when? Now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. I'm closing. I'm going to invite the praise team to come up. I have a few more quotations, but I'd like to have Danielle to come and play softly. I read a story many years ago about a man who was playing a guitar on the street to earn money. He had his guitar in his hand, and he emptied the guitar on the ground, and he had a case sitting next to his feet where people would come and toss the coins as they passed by. He was playing and singing hymns. He had a sign around his neck that read thus, The sun is shining, and I am blind. This blind man was doing what he could to earn money for his livelihood, but what a sad sign he wore. You see, brethren, we don't have to remain blind. The summer of God's grace is giving us time so that we can prepare for the harvest. One of the saddest statements written by the prophet Jeremiah, and we had a hard time going through the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a straight prophet. Was the statement Jeremiah made about the summer. I love the summer. The summer is a time of grand opportunity. It is the most abundant time of the year. It is the best season to prepare for the harvest. But he looked at the children of Israel and he said, you know, they don't know that. God has been trying to get them to pay attention to the summer, and they ignore the summer. The preparation for righteousness, they have ignored the summer. And then he said in Jeremiah 8, verse 20, the harvest is past. Summer is ended. And we are not saved. That is the saddest scripture in the Bible. There are a lot of them, a lake of fire and all, but I think why is this sad to me is because the opportunity was there. It was favorable. The weather was warm. All the conditions for you to get ripe and ready were presented to you, courtesy of God's dear son, Jesus. But it was either too warm or not comfortable enough. And the summer went by and no preparation was made. That's why in the book Child Guidance, we are told in these words, page 161 in paragraph 1, a character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. Those who are under the instruction of Christ in this world will take every divine, every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansion. And in heaven, we are continually to improve. How important, then, is the development of character in this life? But how do you do it? Now that I said you need to do it, I end with this quotation. How do you do it? Here it is. The book Temperance page 112, paragraph 3. God has given us the power of, say it, choice. You're not going to be saved because you didn't have a choice. You're not going to be lost because you didn't have a choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service. But we can choose to serve God. Look at this. When we give him our will, when we can give him our will, then he will work in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus, our whole nature 
will be brought under the control of Christ. Are you there yet? I'm not there yet, but I'm pressing in the right direction. Can I get somebody to join me there? Oh, yeah, your pastor has to pause and say, study your Bible, not for a sermon, but for your own strength. Get on your knees and pray, not because you have a prayer list for somebody else, but you need to pray for yourself. Examine what you do during the day. Is the hour urgent? Yes, it is, Lord. And the reason why I preach this message is because I believe that if we commit our will to the will of God, one day we're going to stand before him because he can finish what he started. Amen. And Paul and I agree, Philippians 1.6, can we say this together? Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work where? In you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. When the roll is called up yonder, but you can't be there without intentional, purposeful, planned out strat strategic growth for your spiritual life. Because if you don't strategize, the devil will. If you don't plan, he has a plan. How many of you today, and I'm going to I'm going to ask this question. This is not a come forward. This is not an altar call. This is a serious moment of contemplation. You know better than anybody else where you are in your walk with Christ. You know all the excuses you tell yourself. And I'm not saying that because you don't come to Bible study that you're lost. That's not what I'm saying. But it's amazing. I've been here for 20 years, and some people have never seen a Bible study. You mean to tell me in 20 years you never can make a day one time? Yet if some special event happens, we all flood there like, fly, like, like, like bugs to a nightlight because it's a popular thing. Take time to be holy. Take time to read God's Word. Take time to examine your life. Take time to shut the world off and to get ready for etern eternal living. If what you do is not in harmony with eternity, filter it out of your life because you don't know when your record is going to close. But when that record comes forth, remember, the resurrection is not going to change your character. If you are moving in the direction of eternity, God's grace will finish what he started in your life. And when he comes, you'll be ready. I'd like you to stand with me today. But wait, before you get up, if you want to be like Jesus, would you stand with me? This is our test. We all got to make the kingdom together. We must all be there. Every provision made for us to be like Jesus was made through the righteous life of Jesus. It doesn't make sense not to be there. So make this your testimony. Can I have the words? Make this your testimony. Make this your testimony.
I know I've disappointed you so many times. And yet you've given me another breath, another day, another opportunity. Your love for me is far greater than sometimes my dedication to you have been. And yet you said whatever you began in me, you're going to complete it. Lord, thank you. Thank you for saying, Pastor, inventory your life. I've not called you to preach it, but to live it. Not to tell others, but to tell me. And so, Father, I pray today that this message, I know there were some parts of it that were heavy, but I pray that these hearts, those minds, those ears, those eyes that have seen and heard what was proclaimed here today would hear the heart of a pastor, a humble servant who himself needs this message. Lord, the kingdom will come. The harvest is on its way. All the indications say that you are right on schedule to come and get your children. What a sad day it would be that we would, confit, we would forfeit that beautiful day for something transient and cheap and earthly. Father, rescue us from the hand of the enemy. Some of us have allowed him to take our minds from us and have convinced us that this thing called Christianity is just a fad. That's a demonic lie. It is our only opportunity to be rescued and saved eternally. So, Lord, wake us up. If we're sleeping in our spiritual walk, wake us up. Bring to us what you brought to Peter. Let us be sifted that we may be awake. Whatever you may do, Lord, when that road is called, may my name, may my name be in that list. And may we come humbly before your throne and say, Father, Thank you for loving me the way you do. Thank you for changing me the way you have. I will tell the story of your redeeming love throughout all the unfallen worlds that I finally have had a song become my reality. I've been praying I would be like Jesus, and now by your work, I am. May we be ready for that glorious day is our prayer. In Jesus' holy name, amen.